There is a way that suits every kind of person. I am like a 10 X or like quantum leap. Love the exhilaration. I'm so in this belief that life is kind and that I am the exception, not the rule. Everything is for me, not to me. And so if I get any intuitive hit, I'm in it. Even if it means it burns down our current life, I know that burning down our current life must be the most glorious next step in our journey. Not everyone has that sort of faith in life. My name is Francesca Phillips, and you're listening to The Good Space Podcast, a show where we help you find peace and power in work, relationships, and intuition. Welcome to The Good Space Podcast. Today, we have a wonderful guest named Megan Camille. She's a psychic and intuitive business consultant who has built her two seven-figure and multi-six-figure businesses from scratch, relying solely on her intuition and inner guidance. As a mother with no college education, Megan understands firsthand the challenges that come with starting a business from the ground up while raising kids. At the age of 19, she was sex trafficked and prostituted, an experience that taught her about the harsh darkness of life but also about the light of opportunity with business. With that innate intuition, she built a successful consulting business that empowers her clients to generate their next six and seven figures while creating lives of sovereignty, joy, and abundance, which is something we always talk about on The Good Space, about having abundance and joy and not being afraid of wealth or different ways that abundance can manifest. So I can't wait to dive into this with her. She firmly believes that business is 80% energetics and 20% strategy. Again, something we love teaching on The Good Space, that when your energy is the main focus, that the rest is even more powerful and potent, and it shows up in a more powerful way. Her clients have gone on to leave their corporate careers and create successful multi-six-figure businesses, add additional streams of income, and have their first million-dollar years. That's huge. And she embodies her own principles, having since founded her own Happily Ever After with her husband and now five children. Megan, thank you for taking the time to chat with me today. Oh, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes. And even just before we got on this call, talking before and just the things that I've looked up on your website and other places that you are online, I just felt such a calming nurturing presence from you. And I was so excited to to get to chat with you. And I'm so grateful that Kim, who was on my podcast before and was my business coach, um, connected us. So wow, thank you. I received that. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here and dive into all the juiciness. Yes. And I'm going to just get this out of the way because I know those listening will be curious about your story because that is obviously not a common one that many of us hear from someone so closely. So I want to, first of all, the, the end goal is how you were able to free yourself and create the life you do now. So what was life like leading up to the moment that you were sex trafficked? How did it happen? Yeah. Yeah. And um, it really is such a captivating story. It feels like a different life uh, because I've done so much healing and integration around it. Um, So it's actually a fascinating and fun story to remember and think about and even share. Uh, But quite honestly, I had a pretty normal life leading up to it. I mean, I was 18 or so and had like anybody, you know, some wounding from childhood, whether it be big T trauma or little T trauma, a little both kind of mixed in there, but seemingly from the outside, very normal life. I was in college and I was a nanny of just feeling myself, you know, lost, not sure what I wanted to do. Uh, Actually, that's not true. I knew what I wanted to do, but had no idea how I could have or do that. And I had this vision. I was at Southwest Institute of Healing Arts to be a hypnotherapist. And I had already gotten my certification and I had these beautiful downloads of being a manifestation or like some sort of spiritual mentor 
whatever. And it felt like ages away, but I had these downloads, these images of what it would be. And yet here I was 18 years old being a nanny, I had no idea how to support myself and also really, really hurt from a previous divorce that my mom was going through. And that was her fourth divorce. And so it was the fourth father that I was saying goodbye to. So much sadness mixed in with like these bursts of inspiration and visions of my future and no clear way of how to get there. And um, knowing that I didn't fit into college, I didn't want to keep going and knowing I didn't want to do what I was doing. So there was a lot of unhappiness. Yeah. From the outside, it probably just like a normal 18 year old you know, trying to find herself, discover where she's going in life. And a dear friend of mine and I went to a club in town and actually in Scottsdale. And that's where I met this gentleman, uh, unbeknownst to me at the time. Keep in mind, I was 18. I didn't even have a fully formed frontal, <laughs> right? Frontal cord uh, brain. And so I was really just enamored by these very handsome men who took uh, a strong interest in me and my friend. And um, really, the rest is history. It was very quickly from there that I ended up in strip clubs and then a cross state lines. And once you cross state lines, you're pretty much, especially 18, you're an adult. Um, you know, my mom called the police a couple times, said, Hey, this is what we're go what's going on. And they're like, she's 18. So there's nothing we can do. She she can leave if she wants to. And so that started a four, four years in the adult industry that included pornography and prostitution in Vegas with this person who for probably the first year or two, I genuinely believed he was my boyfriend. I genuinely believed he loved me, that he was there to take care of me. It was absolutely kind of licking that father wound and having been, you know, abandoned as, as a baby from my father. And then just a revolving door of, of father figures. And he was 42 and I was 18. I didn't know that he was 42. He was very good looking and lied about his age. I didn't know this until I was older and, and really came to what was actually happening. And so in those four years, I lived underneath him and did as he said and, and ha as he wished. And though I made millions of dollars, I eventually uh, left with nothing. Well, not, not nothing. I had great, great little secret ways to, I ended up buying a house. So I left with being able to own a house after making millions of dollars over, over a four year period, most of that went to him. I was able to sneak some away so that I could make a clean break and not go back. But it's where I learned all about sales and all about what it means to make money and not keep money. And also sovereignty, sovereignty. It's so fascinating that you're able to, like you said, integrate this story the way that you did. And so I want to know too about the moment when you were like, I need to get out of this. And was it hard to get out of the situation? So many moments I had that moment and my intuition was always there. I would hear whispers in the middle of the night, you know, like go home go home. Um, I remember being on set one time and this woman was doing my makeup and she asked me how old I was. And I think I just turned 19 and she said, oh, sweet girl, why don't you go home? And I remember having this woman say this to me and this remembrance of hearing that whisper at the night, in the night, like in my own head and knowing that this was an opportunity, an opening for me to like get home. Maybe the next time we just got across state lines or some way I could buy a ticket, any way just to get home. Um, but I, I didn't. I was um, very, very dedicated to this end vision that he had painted for me, which is that we would live happily ever after. He would love me. He would support me. He would take care of me. All I needed to do were these few things to get his 
music business off of off of the ground and so i would have those moments of like oh my god it's time to go and then it got worse where there was eventually abuse physical abuse and the physical abuse much easier to uh, to hold and recover from than the mental abuse right which was turning me against my mom turning me against my family realizing actually i'm all alone in this Las Vegas city as a 19 or 20 year old girl with no place to turn except for him being arrested a few times. The first time I was arrested, I was like, I am going home. And I called my dad who did not come to pick me up, but my pimp came to pick me up. And so that solidified, gosh, he's right. He's the one that loves me. I didn't have the guts to call my mom. I I couldn't, I couldn't manage calling her from jail. And she was already in so much pain about the whole situation that, you know, I, I didn't reach out to her in that time. So there were plenty of times that was like, go home. I remember packing up and ready to leave the next morning. And he broke in, I had a safe. He took my safe with all of the money that I had. And so I needed to stay to work back up. And yet the the further I would go, any sort of deep fall in depression, like, oh, he took everything that I had and now I had to start over, made me extremely vulnerable to, for him to come back in and love up on me again. Like, we don't have to do this, but it doesn't have to be like this. And then I would be sort of hooked back in. So the time that really, really set it apart you know, it was a compounding effect because it was realizing that he was married and had three children and an entire life. And that was it for me. It actually wasn't the sexual abuse. It wasn't the hitting. It wasn't, it wasn't the exploitation. It wasn't the pandering and the pimping. It was that I have been a fool for four years. And so that was when I called my mom and she drove a U-Haul to Las Vegas from Arizona and packed me up and I never went back. Thank goodness for mothers that allow us to come home because that's what saved my life. And that was just the beginning, being able to leave that place. Because after that, I spent a year uh, drowning in drugs and partying and numbing and escaping. And, thank you know, she had a home that I could go and do that in. Um, she didn't necessarily know all that, but I was coming home and, you know, going into these slumps of depression, which was also really helpful for my healing. So one day it was, it was enough. I love though, that you did say your intuition was peeking through those moments that you, I'm sure looking back, you could see it more clearly then, than at that time, but like you knew it was still reaching out to you, speaking to you and what an intense, um, not reckoning, but I feel like, wow, what a like refiner's fire spiritually. Right. Because you could have come out of it, like you could be in a whole different trajectory right now. But the fact that you had the foundation beforehand and just even the desire and the draw to to embrace your spiritual and intuitive gifts, do you feel like that knowing that before all of this happened kind of helped you continue on and you were able to kind of get back on track? Or what do you think was like your saving grace to actually like change everything and not continue going down a destructive path. Yeah. Ultimately my saving grace was me. We are our own greatest teachers. Nobody can do it for us. Not our moms. No one can beat us enough to get us out. No one can love us enough to get us out. We are our own greatest strength and teacher. And so I could boil that down to my intuition. And yet that is still my intuition coming from my highest self, my my true self. And um, I am absolutely grateful that I had the upbringing that I did in the sense that my intuition and our spirituality was really fostered. I had been psychic my entire life. And as opposed to medicating me or putting me in a hospital or thinking there was something wrong with me, uh, my mother and my grandmother really helped me to refine that skill. And we all have that skill to follow our intuition. For me, I was like, oh, no, I just want to be normal. Ah, And actually going with that, with that guy to Vegas was more of a rebellious act 
to having this sort of um, intuitive, the, the psychic ability that was always there. Uh, and it also solidified my knowing of free will, free choice, that our intuition is always there. It is always giving us the correct information and we are free sovereign beings to choose slavery. We are so free. I could choose sex slavery. We are so free. We can hear intuition and choose human action. Um, And so many times in there, I was using my intuition to like avoid the dangerous situations or to capitalize on a great opportunity. So there is many times that I was following my intuition um, in like a here, like in this moment, but not necessarily in a like, go home. You can, you can live a different life. You know, that was where I was kind of exercising my free will, free choice. Like I am an adult. I can do what I want. And he loves me. And I'm going to be honest with you. Psychic stuff I'm always skeptical of, right? I obviously believe in intuition, but when it comes to people being psychics or whatever, I'm always like, mm, I don't know about this. So I'm I'm very open-minded and I want to know, one, how did you know you had that gift? Like, how does it look like, feel like, how did you know that was something that you held? And then two, how do you use that now in your work, in your life, all of those things? Yeah. Well, I too was really resistant. And um, I would say that what I experienced, the closest definition would be psychic. It isn't my favorite word, which is why I tend to use the word intuitive. Now, intuitive is more like self-centered. So like centered on self, right? And psychic is kind of being in touch with with the whole quantum grid and it's seeing past, present, and future because there is no past, present, and future. If you're tapping into the quantum grid, you can see any point in time. And uh, for me as a little girl, I was quite confused of how did I see this, but now I'm here in this family. And so even looking back to it, I could do, I could describe it from human adult terms, but that is not how I experienced it as a little girl. As a little girl, it was, I was seeing other beings. I was seeing people coming in and out of what looked like portals. I was getting messages of my, for my family, for myself. And by the time I was 15, my mom, who was, uh, who is still, but was at that time, a women's empowerment coach, isn't that funny? She had a daughter that was sex trafficked (laughs) and we're all gifted the perfect mirrors for what helps us be our best selves. But she would bring me into these groups and I would give people readings and they just happened to be corporate or uh, business owners. They were professional women and the accuracy in which I could give a reading or, um, you know, tell the the future for, for lack of a better term was really astounding. And so for me, it just honestly made me feel like an ugly duckling. It made me feel like the black sheep. I felt so different. I mean, I was visited by galactics and inner earth family that I didn't have vocabulary for, but I had a knowing of how everything is all good. Like everything is good. And I was still afraid, right? So I I had these very enlightened knowings, but only the logic of a child. So for me, it was, it was not comfortable. I didn't enjoy it. It wasn't until I was older where I was like, you know, I've been giving readings for 15 years. What would it look like if I did it for myself? What would it look like if I exercised some of this for me? And that's when intuitive business consulting became a thing. And actually, I've started four businesses. I've created four multiple six and seven figure businesses, and I'm with two now. And I had no idea that intuitive business consulting was even a thing. It started with um, a brick and mortar, which was a nonprofit 501c3. And I had no call college education. I was breastfeeding a baby and had a toddler and in a fairly unhappy marriage, I would say it was an average marriage. I wasn't like terribly unhappy, but I was not fulfilled. It was a very traditional role. 
It was the swing. It was the pendulum swing from being in Vegas to now married to someone who would support me. And I built this business using my intuition. He's like, this is a bad idea. You don't know anything about business. Like this could tank you. This could tank us. Da, 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 da. And he eventually gave me an ultimatum. Either stop working this business and stay married to me or we got to get divorced. So he's my former husband. <laughs> I guess everybody knows what I probably chose. Uh, at that point, I, I had vowed to listen to my intuition, no matter what. And that was one of the biggest, most challenging times of, I would say, leaving Vegas. And then saying, okay, I choose, I choose my intuition here. For some reason, she is saying that I got to go down this path. I'm sorry you don't choose me in that. That's so powerful. And what an incredible experience. I'm sure it was very painful at the time, but I'm thinking how incredible that this was like, okay, Megan, you said you'd follow your intuition. Here's like almost a test, right? Is this actually the way you want to go? And I'm just proud of you for, for choosing you and choosing what you knew was right. And so I I have a 10 month old and I know how your world is just rocked with that first kid, right? Just integrating your identity, who you are with this new being and how life is morphing and you really can't go back to how everything exactly was before, right? So I am curious, do your kids know about this part of your life and where you're from and if so, like how do you explain it to them? How do you like yeah, I'm just so curious how all of that weaves together. Yeah. Well, they're definitely, I would say that they know, well, they don't know any different, right? So they just know me as their mom, who is a very intuitive. I could go in in the morning and I knew exactly what was going on with Salem, my, my older daughter, or, you know, I knew that something was coming up with my daughter snow and a few days later she had a seizure. So they're, they just know that of me. Now they don't know because my oldest is nine. And then, oh, actually our oldest is my husband's daughter and she is 16. There is like that kind of conversation, which is drastically different than the nine or eight-year-old that have no idea, but eventually will just because there's information out there. I mean, nothing, nothing dies now that there's the, there's the internet. And then my little ones, the twins, they're only a year and a half. And so they definitely know me as witchy and intuitive, but to them, that's not so much a label, right? Like that just is mom. I say that a family that processes together stays together. So we're always coming in, like, what is the sensation I feel in my body? What is the voice that I hear that maybe doesn't sound like our words, but there's still a voice? What is the knowing that comes into my mind without having to go outward and seek? What emotions are coming up and what do those emotions tell me to do versus what do I know I need to do or know I can do? So this is a very normal way of life for us as opposed to like, hey, mommy's a little different. because they're actually quite different because they've known nothing other than actually we follow what comes into our sphere that is our inner voice versus you know dr google or uh, a textbook or anything like that i hope i can instill processing that way too for my daughter i think that's a lot of that's so healthy and just very aware and very in tune. And I love that. The information you're hearing is what I wrote for our daily email, the good space daily. So if you're already signed up, you'll have these tips and writing in your inbox. And if you're not already signed up and you're listening to this after the fact of us dripping them out live, we'll make it so that when you sign up, you can specifically ask for these emails and get them dripped out to you when you sign up. And that's the same with all the other topics and themes that we'll be covering for feeling your best. So If you want to get these short daily reminders to access your authentic self in all areas of life and get resources, chances to win things, all of the good stuff, then make sure to sign up now. The link is in the show notes, or you can go to findyourgoodspace.com.
So kind of going back to what you said about your ability to predict someone's success in business, you would give readings, right? And you would be able with accuracy, know what the future would hold. So I know you also said that we're sovereign and we have choice. So were these readings and these visions based on like, if you do X, Y, and Z, or like, how do you know that that's going to happen if the person has choice, right? Like, is it just you know, we're predictable humans. So basically like this is going to happen because the likelihood of you just changing out of nowhere, you know, I guess I'm just curious how that works. This is such a great question because the way I give readings now is a much more self-actualized whole woman versus what I learned was being psychic or how to give readings because my mom started being like, let's research these other people. Like here's Sylvia Brown and here's, you know, all these people that, that do that. And so I was really trying to fit into like, well, what are they doing? That's how I have to do it. And but also recognizing what I was seeing was vastly different. I had much less ego than they did simply because I was alive less time, right? So I didn't have as many aspects of self. I didn't have an ego that had been through 40 or 50 years. She was like nine and so so still very impressionable. Really, the way I describe it now is when I tune in, I see the quantum field, which is where we all are, but it it looks different because where we're at right now, it all comes into one point for focus, for matter. And when I let go of the ego self, Megan, and I just go into the expansion of it, what you see the quantum field and there's endless, best way to describe it is that timelines endless potentials. We, we couldn't count them. They're endless. And we do have an ideal timeline that our soul came here assuming to have. But that soul also came here with the excitement of free will, free choice. Like, will I choose it? Like, do I want it? What happens if I am uh, enticed by a really handsome pimp? Oh, right? Like who knows? So we have these endless potentialities and we have like a highlighted one that has not a whole lot of detail, but it has particular in, in integrative life lessons like healing my inner child, like reparenting a little girl that didn't have a father, like owning her blessing, like learning how to become sovereign and uh, generate her own money. You could see that what I'm doing now was kind of already foreshadowed even in Vegas, right? There was this out of the ordinary way of generating income. And so the main goals are on a particular ideal timeline, but we have all these options and there really is no such thing as wrong. There's just an ideal one that we always feel a pull to. We just feel the pull. And so our goal is to follow that pull. And most people will come and have a reading and they'll go, yeah, I feel that pull, but it doesn't make sense. It isn't logical. I can't make the choices that would allow for that timeline to flourish or happen. And so they don't. But the point is they can. We have free will, free choice. And so when I do readings, I don't do one-off readings because that doesn't support anyone. Because every time we uh, we make a shift in our life, our quantum grid shifts. So when I go in and I read you, we're reading in this present moment, the only moment that actually exists And then any shift or change that you make in your life rearranges that grid, which is why now when I support people in launching businesses or scaling businesses, it is a repetitive. We meet every week or we meet every two weeks because what did you implement this week? This now made a micro adjustment or a macro adjustment for talking quantum leaping, which most people can't actually maintain in their system. But if we're making these micro adjustments, that's getting us in alignment to our highest good or our ideal timeline, then we actually have new action steps to take this week than we did last week. So a reading one time per year isn't going to take you home. A reading one time per year can show you, you know, 
what is possible and what your ideal timeline is. But then what happens when you wake up tomorrow morning and you're like, wait, I've got five kids downstairs and, you know, I don't feel good and I'm not sure exactly what to offer. Well, now we just go back to what we know. And for some people, that's a job. That's so interesting because I definitely believe in quantum stuff and I've read the field. I've, you know, Joe Dispenza, all those people. And I just love how you're describing it. And it it absolutely makes sense to me. I don't know if this is the same thing, but a friend of mine talked about this concept timeline jumping. And I wonder if now that's the same thing you're talking about. So, okay. So my first, well, I have two questions. So one is how do you yourself get in tune with that quantum field and, and plug in, as you say, and, and release the ego and you're not Megan anymore. You're just in that expansiveness like if there is anything that you do to get in that state and then also is timeline jumping in fact what you just described where you like know there's different timelines and you per- like is there a way to purposefully shift and jump or is it like the micro adjustments like you said yeah well i'll do the timeline one and then how do i tap in cuz timeline shifting is the same as like quantum leaping what i see most often after two decades of working with people is that they are very excited for a quantum leap and a shift in their timeline until they're in a new timeline. And then they're like, holy shit, holy shit, holy shit, everything is different. Well, yeah, (laughs) right? Our humanness, our ego wants to go, oh, I only wanted this one thing different, not all of this. And so most people's systems are not refined and regulated enough to truly withstand an increase in frequency that would take us to a timeline that we enjoy more. Otherwise, we would already be there. Now we can make the jump, uh, but that's about the time that people go, oh, never mind. This is really uncomfortable. I am feeling dysregulated or my husband doesn't like the idea and is giving me an ultimatum or my mom doesn't agree with me or society doesn't like it, or it doesn't make logical sense. And they go back sometimes even further than where they were into safety, which is our ego, because our ego is here to survive, not to thrive. And I love the ego. We have so many aspects of ego. I am always loving on every single aspect, just making sure that neither one of them are actually directing the boat, that my highest self is the one directing the boat. And that takes me to the next question, which is, how do I get into the state to be able to see all of this? Well, one, I, like I said before, I was really blessed in having a family that cultivated what was coming through for me, even though they didn't quite understand. They still loved and honored that it was my experience. And so being able to get into that space is fairly easy for me now. I mean, just right now I'm in the space. Anytime I sit down to work with clients, I move into the space. Really my practice at this point is to elongate that space of being the I am or the oneness that we all are, as opposed to the individual, which is Megan. Or there's also Shasta and Carol and all these other aspects in me that fold into Megan. And so my practice is to how long can I hold being in the I am or the the oneness presence and some of the ways that have helped me elongate that and some of the ways that I support my clients in learning how to do it. Because once we feel it and we imprint it, we can go and recreate it over and over and over. Once you've imprinted it, it just is. We all technically have the imprint, but most of us have also been programmed for however many, however however old you are, how many years you are of not being that and being Francesca and being Megan and being Samson, my son, right? And so some of the quicker ways that I support my clients and getting into that oneness state, which is how I read the quantum field, which is how I know past, present, and future would be breath work. It is definitely cold plunge. I'm not talking about cold plunge for like one or two minutes. So it's great for your your body fat and that sort of thing. I'm talking like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Like how long can you actually get into there until you are no longer there? And one of my most favorite is plant medicine journeys. Ayahuasca, psilocybin, sitting with plant medicine will get you there quite quickly. 
Whoa, that's so interesting. Um, definitely things that I would be like hesitant to try, but I've heard it, it's really helped some people. So that's very, very interesting. And actually, I used to do this thing where I would put an ice pack on my vagal nerve, like on each side of my neck and then my chest for seven minutes on each side. And not saying it gives the same effect, but like it totally relaxed me and just I would sleep so much better. And anyways, it's just so interesting to hear everything that you do. And I definitely feel like that energy and that presence as you're talking about it, which is so cool. And for anyone listening who these concepts, you were like, quantum what? Like energy what? Oneness what? I was thinking of this principle that I learned from Dr. Benjamin Hardy. And he wrote this book about the concepts that Dan Sullivan, he's a strategic coach. It's called 10Xing is easier than 2Xing. And it kind of reminded me of like what you're saying, just like grounding it a little bit for someone who may not understand. So actually 10Xing, the idea of doing something so that sounds impossible, that's bigger than anything you've been doing is actually easier than doing something just a little bit different because there's so many paths to a 2X situation. You know what I mean? So like, if I'm just going to do something a little bit better, there's probably 15 different things to get to it. And so now I'm overwhelmed. Now I don't know which path to take. And so it kind of just, you get back into that safety. Whereas if I think of a goal or something that's like way out there and that's impossible, there's probably one or two paths to get there. And so now it requires you to change your mindset, your energy, 80% of your life. It's the 80-20 principle. When something is so big and expansive, it requires that you change 80% of your life. And then you go in on the 20% that actually matters versus most people, they want to keep the 80% of their life and they only want to tweak 20%. And so I don't know if that makes sense, but I just thought there's somewhat of a connection for people who may not understand the like language as much, but I don't know if that resonates for you as well. But I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. That 10X is where I would say like, plant journey, plant medicine journeys, like that, the sort of uh, cold therapy that I was just talking to breath work that includes rebirthing, that would be the 10 X. And for people who are like, eh, eh, I just want a little, I want a little different. Um, that's where I would go because even for those 10 X sorts of things, you want to have a baseline. Like, do you know how to regulate your nervous system? Do you know how to sit with your inner child? Um, do you know how to shift your state? like this, like, do you actually know how to, when you are overwhelmed with emotions and thoughts, do you know how to be the observer and not be the emotions and thoughts? If you have that baseline, then this 10 X stuff is like definitely for you. If you're still in that space of like, Oh no, I believe every thought I have and I identify with how I'm feeling. Then you may want to start with, you know, not, not such intense, such intense experiences, but more like inner child work and, and reparenting in a very present state, as opposed to like plant medicine. So reparenting, I love anything by Byron Katie, where you do the inquiry process. And, and once you begin to realize oh yeah, I am not my thoughts and I am not my emotions. Then you can do this quantum leaping stuff. Some people are kind of built for it and they love it and they thrive. And I'm one of those people where other people, they really like the the safe feeling. And so you can take smaller incremental steps. Like uh, not that Byron Katie's work, her shit is profound and is life-changing, but it's doable in the middle of the afternoon. It's doable in between your shifts. It's doable before your kids get up. Do you think it's possible for someone who may need the lesser stuff initially? Do you have to do the 10x stuff to get the timeline that you probably would most desire? Or is there a way that suits every kind of person, I guess? There is a way that suits every kind of person. I am like a 10 X or like quantum leap, love the exhilaration. I'm so in this belief that life is kind and that I am the exception, not the rule. Everything is for me, not to me. And so if I get any intuitive hit, I'm in it. Even if it means it burns down our current life, I know that burning down our current life must be the most glorious next step in our journey. Not everyone has 
has that sort of faith in life. Like my husband, who is a slow processor. He really needs to feel it, body, mind, and soul before he's moving forward. He's the type to make micro adjustments over time. And so when I said, hey, babe, you should retire and let's go do this and this and this. He's like, why, why would I do that? Well, because you don't love your job. But why would I do that? <laughs> Nobody loves their job, <laughs> right? I'm like, actually, I do. And so it took him a couple of years and then he transitioned out of his current or out of his job. He retired. But that was like a two year thing where he was making micro adjustments and he was doing parts work, right? Uh, but the book, No Bad Parts, this is knowing all of our aspects of self. And he's, you know, he did that work. He went on his own plant medicine journeys and was doing like these micro adjustments where that kind of move happened over a two year span, where a move like that for me would happen in two weeks. And I would be really excited about it. And he, he's really excited about it in micro adjustments. That's so interesting. And so because you're just in it and you can do it in, like you said, two weeks versus two years, like how do you adjust with having people in your life that maybe aren't exactly where you're at? Like just because I'm I'm guessing because he accepts it, but just needs a little time, you're probably more willing to be okay with that than a husband who's like, you can't do it or we're getting a divorce. You know what I mean? Like, I guess I'm just curious, like how that feels to exist in just oh, the world in general, like I'm sure ev- almost everyone you meet isn't as like trusting or knowing as you are. There's a few people that have allowed me to see what can be. And so really kind of honing in on those particular mentors that that have done it has really supported me. And I would say that I could go into a story that it's a little lonely, right? It's a little lonely to be one that's like, yep, let's go. And everyone else is like, we'll see you in a couple of years. And then by the time they're there, I'm on to the next thing. And really that there there is that story, but there's also, I can deeply connect and be with anyone wherever they're at, that it no longer becomes a personal thing. Like, oh, I'm doing it wrong or they're doing it wrong. Actually, we're all doing it just right. And it kind of takes me to, you know, my human design. I'm a manifester. And so when the energy strikes, I must go with it. And for my husband, who's like, opposite end of the spectrum. He's a generator, which means he needs to feel it. He needs to just like absolutely know that this is it for him. Um, He's a slower processor. We still work really well because we can enjoy each other's process and not make any stories about us. So that's where I really get, I have like laid down this, oh gosh, it's a little bit lonely over here, like quantum leaping. And, you know, I'm in a mastermind here and then quickly outgrow and then here and quickly outgrow. And instead I've just enjoyed to, I've enjoyed the journey. I'm a manifesting generator. So I don't know what that means. Cause now that you have said both separately, I'm like, so does that mean it's a conflict? Like, what does it mean if you're both? Yeah. Um, my mom is a manifesting generator. She's the co-founder of the Sophia Mystery School, which is my second business. Uh, you know, manifesting generators, they tend to have multiple projects going and they will tend to be like, oh gosh, look at that manifester doing that. I should be doing that. But depending upon what your response or what your, um, I can't think of the word, but if you're like a responder, which you probably are, if you're a manifesting generator, which means uh, inspiration will come through someone else. And then you'll go, oh, wait, I feel really compelled to do that. And so for you, it's to not go and do anything until you feel compelled. Uh, FOMO would be like your kryptonite. You'd be like, but she's doing it like this. I should go do it like her because it's working for her. Most of my clientele are manifesting generators. And so they're like, well, I should do it like that because it's working there. Wait, no, now I should go do that because it's working there. And it can get a little bouncy. Whereas yours would just be, wait until you really feel a calling and you can't help but be compelled. And then you move with that. If it's FOMO, that's not yours. And if you get this ugh, sinking feeling, that's not yours. Um, So your intuition is really going to be probably a compelled feeling. Like I can't help but do this. 
Yes. I see myself in everything that you said. And it's funny because some of my best work and things that have worked out amazing, I literally have had periods where I'm like, I'm not doing anything until I'm, I feel like it's a compulsion that I need to do it. And that's when I'll often write like 10 pages of a book I'm writing or like 10 pages for an, for my daily email. And it's like, great, I'm good. I'm good for the month. And that just happened in an hour. Whereas normally I waste hours and hours like being like, when is it coming? When's the inspiration? It's like, no, if you just chill, it will come, it will show up, it will arrive. So just be peaceful and wait and then just know it will come when it's supposed to. And so I love that you confirmed that. And so for your clients, from what I've gathered so far, a lot of the times they struggle taking action on the things that, you know, either you've given to them or they feel they need to do. And it's like, ooh, that's too much change. Would you say that's the number one reason your clients struggle? Or what do you feel like is the number one reason most of your clients or people in general struggle to know their purpose or grow their business? Yeah, I would uh, say that actually pretty much everyone knows their purpose. They will go, I don't think I know my purpose because the purpose that they know they have doesn't fit into a nine to five programming and doesn't fit mainstream. And so they don't believe that that could possibly be their purpose. So discovering purpose and a strategy for that purpose is usually the quickest, easiest thing uh, that I support my clients with. It is then helping them learn what their natural rhythm is, which we sort of just talked about that. Like what is their natural rhythm? Nobody's natural rhythm is 40 hours a week. I ask a lot of people, what do you do other than sleep for 40 hours a week? And why did we ever believe that insidious programming, that we should leave our family, that we should leave our children, that we should leave ourselves and go out there and do something for someone else for change for most of our waking life? It's an insidious programming and nobody's natural rhythm fits it. It is something that we have to force. You wake up at this time, you go and you work for this many hours, and then you come home and eat a little bit and then you go to bed and then you rinse and repeat this for most of your life. So nobody actually fits into that. So typically what I'm supporting my clients with is uh, figuring out what their natural rhythm is and then how to curate a strategy that allows your business to support your natural rhythm, aka your lifestyle. Um, And for me, I work three to four hours a day, three to four days a week. And that's with two businesses. And we make multiple six and seven figures in the other business uh, in intuitive uh, business consulting. And so time does not equate money. Our value is what equates to money, not our time. And so really supporting people and figuring out what is their natural rhythm and what strategy is going to support that natural rhythm. And how do you make your purpose monetizable. They're usually just going like, I have no idea. Those would be the clients that are coming in and ready, ready to launch, like ready to be out of corporate and they're ready to launch their own business. That's what I would support them with. My other clients who are already at multiple six figures and they're moving into seven figures, it's typically that they have structured a business thinking like, okay, well, I'll I'll be a business owner. And so I'll have all this time and financial freedom. Um, But actually they just structured what they already knew, which was nine to five. It was a lot of hustle. It's a lot of grind. It's a lot of trading time for money. Even if you're selling packages, you're actually trading time for money. And so it typically for my clients that are in the multiple six figures already, they need a restructure. They have great bones. So it's typically just some tweaking and the inner work. Like, how do I actually believe that I can receive millions of dollars a year without sacrificing a piece of me? Um, so those would be the things that that are like the biggest pain points for my clients. That's so interesting. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of it is the inner work. And I'm like, oh, I see so many things in there that I want to improve on and work on. And so it's nice to know it's not just me. And I'm sure it's a common shared like struggle that a lot of business owners and dreamers and creatives have. So yeah, that's thank you for sharing that. Okay. Before we sign off, I am curious, what does a good space look like to you? And so to explain it a little bit, the good space I created it as a way for people to 
come and learn different concepts, information, anything that calls to them so that they can create a life that they feel good in, that they can feel peaceful in, that they can feel positive in. And so I'm just curious, like what does your good space look like to you? Mm, That's good. That's good. (laughs) My good space looks like all of me belongs, that there is nothing I can come to the table with that I will shame myself or um, cut away anymore, that the golden child in me belongs and so does the wild child, that the businesswoman belongs as well as the Philly cheese steak eating TV binging like out for the day belongs like they all of me belongs and so I have books that support all of it right like I have a book to to just read because it's a fun day or I have a book to read on business or I have a book to read on creativity so anything I no longer try to fit into one category I know that I'm multifaceted And so a good space for me is that all of me belongs and anyone who comes into my space, all of them belongs. Thank you. That was lovely. I enjoyed hearing that. Okay. Do you recommend any books just based off our conversation and based off of who might be hearing this? Yes. Oh my gosh. So many. Um, Well, it depends upon where you are in your journey. If you're a little bit newer to the concepts that we're talking about, I love Florence Scovel Shin. Um, Her collection is great. Um, That's awesome. Anything by Abraham Hicks and Dr. Joe Dispenza, I feel like are great gateways that are really profound and really move to meet the needle, but they're not like super esoteric. Now, once you have created a lot of great results from all the love and light that you learn with those people, um, I highly recommend to start delving into your shadow, which is where some of the greatest pieces of you live. And that's where Byron Katie would come in. I've listened and read all of her books, so you could start anywhere with her. But I highly recommend that you actually do her work, the inquiry process. And then other great shadow work is Existential Kink by Carolyn L. Elliot, a mentor who I still work with. I've worked with him for years now, Rainier Wild. Uh, his book is As You Are. So, and let's see, The Awakened Being by Marcy Locke. That's a very esoteric, right? Like we're definitely into the plant medicine realm and, and that sort of thing. So those would be my, my top ones. That's a great list. And we'll make sure to link everything you mentioned in the show notes. And obviously, where can we find you if anyone wants to connect with you, reach out, learn more about what you do? Yeah, for sure. You can find me at www.megancamille.com. You can also find me on Instagram at the Megan Camille. I'm on Facebook. Yeah, I'm all those places. Great. And we will also make sure to link those in the show notes. So it's really easy if you're listening to hop on over and connect with her. Megan, thank you so much for spending time with me and sharing all of your wisdom, all of your light. And I really just wish nothing but the best for you. And I'm so grateful that we connected. Thank you so much for having me. You are a natural. This was such a fun interview. Great questions. And it was a pleasure to be here. If you like what you're hearing so far and feel inspired or changed or just motivated after hearing this message, please consider joining our membership. We work so hard to dissect information and make it simple and digestible for you so you can go out in the world and be a light, connect to your authentic self. And we really want to continue being that landing place for you. So if you're considering even one message or brand to support, we hope that you'll consider ours. And if you want a link for that, it is in the show notes. Now it's time for an affirmation. I allow everything about me to belong. I make perfect sense and life is kind to me.
If you found today's tips inspiring or thought-provoking, share it right now on social media and make sure to tag me at Francesca A. Phillips or at Find Your Good Space and also weigh in in the comment section at findyourgoodspace.com. You can find links in the show notes. And if you have a spiritual or mindfulness problem that you want me to unpack on an upcoming The Good Space episode or an awesome manifesting story you want to share, give my podcast phone line a ring right now at 917-719-0867. Also, don't forget to download my free morning routine guide. It's what helped me reduce my anxiety, increase productivity, and so much more. The link to everything I mentioned is in the show notes. See you soon.